Today, I got the chance to connect with Tom Jones, a renowned dialect coach who's actually worked with Davine Joy Randolph on multiple occasions. I was so embarrassed when he corrected me on how to pronounce her name. You can't even believe it. names are so difficult for me. And I didn't even realize how much Tom and I had in common, including both of us having gone to what are called SUNY schools. You're going to hear us say that a lot. SUNY stands for State University of New York. And we both have a passion for accents, and we want to share that passion with you today in talking about the specifics of a Boston accent. I hope you pick up a lot of interesting facts from today's episode about her performance. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I'm here to help you master an American accent in English because your voice is your choice when it comes to how you sound. I try to release a podcast episode every two weeks, and so you should really subscribe to whatever podcast platform you use so that you don't miss the newest episode. And by the way, if you want to see the full video of the episode, it's available at Accent Coach Bianca on YouTube. Now, let's get on with the show. So thank you, Tom, for coming to join me today and talk about the movie The Holdovers. Today, we want to talk about uh, Divine Join Randolph's performance. As Mary, we want to get into the Boston accent, maybe how that differs a little bit from other accents, how you got into this work, maybe some of your past projects, if you want to mention them, like Ready Player One or Captain Marvel, anything like that that you want to tell us about. We'd love to first hear about you. So maybe you can start by telling us how you got into dialect coaching. Oh, gosh. Okay. I trained classically as an actor, and that that usually means that a person who trains as an actor classically goes to a conservatory program of some kind. And I went to the State University of New York at Purchase, which has a very good acting conservatory, and studied there and had a very good time there. And my teachers picked up on the fact that I had a talent in the area of voice and speech, which is a very particular discipline in relation to what actors study. You study voice, speech, movement, acting, obviously, but acting in various styles, clowning, fencing, mask work. It's very extensive if you study classically this stuff. And you mm-hmm. do periods, you work on Shakespeare all the way up through contemporary work. And that curriculum has gotten much more diversified than it was when I came through it 30 years ago. The playwrights that were teaching these programs has become much more diversified. We, it used to always be Shakespeare, but now it's much more varied. So that's a good mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of diversity going on in academia now and a lot of people are trying to move things forward as far as the way that we teach the skills for actors and for artists in general. So that's a good thing. But anyway, the teachers picked up on the fact that I was talented in this area. And then they started asking me to work with some of the other students that were maybe didn't have an ear for it or needed extra help. And so I got involved with teaching while I was still in my studies myself. And then when I left Purchase and went to New York, my voice teacher, who was a guy named Chuck Jones, asked me if I would come teach with him at NYU in their program that they had with Playwrights Horizons, which is a, a theater in New York that does a lot of new work. And so I taught for them. That's where I started teaching. And then I went back to purchase. They asked me to come back and teach speech there. I'm a unique speech teacher in that I teach voice and speech, which is more akin to the way that it's taught in England and America. Mm. The two disciplines are often separated from each other. Could always sing and had a good voice and was interested in speech as well. And so they just went together for me as a holistic kind of a thing. Eventually, at purchase, they asked me to head their voice and speech program. And so I did that. And then while that was happening, Brown University was starting a new program and recruited me to move to Rhode Island and be the head of voice and speech for Brown University's Master of Fine Arts in Acting and Directing. So we moved up here and now I live in Rhode Island, but I no longer work for Brown. But I did for about 20 years and probably about three or four years after moving up here, a show came to town. It was a Showtime series called The Brotherhood and they were looking for a dialect coach, a local dialect coach. And I was already the voice coach for the Trinity Rep, which is a regional theater here in Rhode Island, a very fine one. And so I had a great, the great pleasure of working there for many years. And mm-hmm. they found me through the theater and this production company that was doing this Showtime series. And I sat down with the director who was an Australian 
And he, he had already been around and had already been recording people in Rhode Island, which was very cool. Usually that's my job, go people. But he started playing me some of the samples he'd collected. And that's what we call a, like a recording of somebody's speech. We call it a sample. But he uh, started playing me some of his samples and I was listening to them. They were all Rhode Islanders, but I was saying, oh, okay. That person is uh, Portuguese descent. That person is Irish descent. That person is, <laughs> as I can hear in the vocal placement and also in the rhythm of the way somebody speaks, if they have the Rhode Island accent, which you talk about Rhode Island since that's where I am, pretty much everybody that speaks in the Rhode Island way shares most of the phonetics, a lot of the rhythm things, and a lot of the voice things. But there'll be slight differences depending upon somebody's cultural background. You can hear that in that's evident in the recordings and in, especially, like I said, in the rhythm. Vocal placement is like a way of describing posture in the mouth, mm. inside the mouth, what muscles are being used. When somebody speaks accented English, then what that is the most simplified way of putting it, and you know this because you work in this area, but is somebody is speaking English with, okay, let's say somebody speaks English with a Spanish accent. They are speaking English through muscles that are accustomed to the posture needed for Spanish. And so that's what's happening. So many times when I have to coach an actor to do accented English, like a French accent or something like that, I'll say, do you speak any French? <laughs> if I find out that they do, then I'm like, okay, speak French for a little while. Mm -hmm. Get a sensation of what's going on in your body, in your mouth, mm -hmm. with your tongue, with the base of your tongue, with your soft palate, with your relationship to your breath, all of it. And then I'm like, okay, now through that same sensation, speak English. And they'll get a good 70 to 80 percent of the phonetic sound substitutions or sound changes mm -hmm. that I teach them, show them the sheet of, okay, this sound goes to the sound goes to yeah. blah, blah, blah. Sometimes you don't need all of that if somebody has a sense of it. Yeah, I feel like there's people who had these experiences which lend them a skill that other people might not have. Maybe depending on their background, they've moved around a lot. They've, they've had that experience where some people spend all of their life in one place and they just don't have either the, the ear for that. They can't pick out the, the ambiguity. They have no tolerance for ambiguity or they just don't have that ability hone, let's say at all, but then some people, oh yeah, some people get flip it on and off like a switch. They can do the code switching. For me, the thing you mentioned about the placement, I think, is a giveaway that it's hard. You don't hear it unless you start to learn about it. And then you're like, ah, oh, okay. There's that one little thing where your posture has been like this for so long that if you listen enough, you can pick it out. And some people can't do that. So I know you have this huge skill set. And can we go back to the idea of Rhode Island? Because as far as I know, you are the guy to go to for a Rhode Island accent training. And it's interesting to me that you mentioned SUNY Purchase because I'm a SUNY girl also, a SUNY where Albany. Did you, where did you go? Yeah, I went to SUNY Albany and then oh. I transferred to Temple down in Philly. Yeah, sure. And it's, yeah, it's interesting to me because you spent time in New York and then you moved up a little bit farther. But I've read that you're originally from Florida. Is that the case? I'm originally from Florida. I did about 16 and went to a performing arts high school in Michigan called the mm -hmm. And I was there for two years. And then I auditioned for those classical acting programs and got into purchase and went there. Huh. And is it okay if I ask you then about your own personal, let's say, reflections on accent and maybe who you were at that time and how that might have lent to your identity and how you maybe changed that or noticed anything when you went to Michigan and then you went to purchase? Oh my like, God, there's so much I noticed. And that's a great, that's such a cool question. So personal. Look, as a small child, I was walking around with a tape recorder, tape recording everybody. I was just fascinated <laughs> with the way people talk. I was fascinated with voices. I remember one time playing my mother for her and my mother's family was from the mountains of Tennessee. Mm. So they, they, she had a very particular way of speaking. And I remember playing a, a clip that I had recorded of her. I think I was probably about nine or 10 years old, something like that. But I remember very vividly her saying after hearing herself, oh, good Lord, I sound like a hick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she, and she was marvelous. But yeah, she had that kind of mountain 
hillbilly sound. And oh my God. You mentioned that. And my family is originally from upstate New York. So in the mountains, in the Adirondacks, right? My father's side of the family, all the same. And also when I was a child, I used to collect flashcards. You remember when flashcards were right. still on paper? Yeah. I would go to like garage sales and collect all the flashcards. And I was also enthralled with like language and how people spoke. And how does, how do like these drawings on paper become words out of our mouth? And why is it that when it comes out of your mouth, it sounds different than when it comes out of my maternal grandmother's mouth? And yeah, I was also fascinated with all of those things, even just as a small child. Yeah, the way we speak tells a story of our history and our family's history and what we're connected to or with, and it's our ancestry, everything. Look, in speech training, specifically speech training, it used to be, especially for actors, that you were expected to fit into a certain sound. But this wasn't just true for actors. A lot of you have to speak a certain way if you're going to be successful. And it was pretty much the way that was adopted was a way that people actually spoke. The Northeast, white people mm -hmm. with high level of education and a lot of wealth. So like Franklin Delano Roosevelt or Eleanor Roosevelt or the Kennedys to a circle. Mm -hmm. They had so much mass happening in their sound that theirs was a little maybe less refined on some level than some of these refined in quotes, right? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, these words that we use that, that judge people's speech, we have to try to be very aware of that because it's just a way of speaking. It's another way of speaking that reflects yeah. a certain group of people or a family or an individual. And it can fall under those. Th you're getting more and more specific. You mentioned idiolect earlier. That's the way an individual speaks, their particular way. So you have that within a family. It's like the family has this way of speaking, but then you get down. But, oh, that, for some reason, when my sister says the word both, she inserts an L. And I don't understand. And then I've come across other people in my life that do this thing, too. They don't say both. They say both. And uh -huh. they, with that sort of very throaty American L, right? Both. To both, there's no L in it. Or, or many people, she does this too, my sister, bless her. She adds L's in places where they don't belong. She says, I saw it. And my brother like, used to say snarns, up, going up the snarns instead of the stairs. And I don't think he was dyslexic at all, but he, yeah, he would. My sister has any dyslexia or, or anything like that either. It was just her own unique thing. And Absolutely. so anyway, we were all taught to speak that kind of Northeastern elite, white, educated, blah, 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 sort of like classical American in a way. Mm. Also what they used in the old films often, it became what was considered a, an American standard. But when we get into standards, we're getting into some idea of, you know. To me, it's power and politics and prejudice power. and bias it's, and there's hierarchies and yeah, it's, and it's not. It's completely that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so this stuff is falling away, which is good because we're becoming more and more aware. So in the teaching now, when teaching dialects or accents, so say I'm teaching, I'm not at the moment, but I used to teach grad school, mm -hmm. teaching a group of grad school students dialect classes. And I would say, you are going to learn everything. You are going to learn everything. And because we were going to learn how to learn a dialect or an accent first, and then we're going to learn many different ones. And I look at the group and go, okay, what's the possible casting among this group so that there's a diversity in the accents and the dialects that are being taught and everybody is going to learn everything. It was some Back at first, when I started doing this, white students would come to me and say, I don't understand why I'm learning Jamaican. I was like, uh -huh. well, you see that wonderful black actor that you're studying? Uh -huh. They've been learning all of these white dialects. And so you're going to learn one for them uh -huh. and we'll learn this together. And learning a dialect or an accent is always a useful thing. It doesn't matter if you end up using it in your career or not. You are expanding your knowledge. It sounds like you were teaching people to learn how to learn basically, and how to apply those to essentially anything and to see it and pick it out and empower them to do it themselves on right. some level. I just love that. And and I think you were fortunate and because sometimes is the case when I was teaching a lot, you'd have these very homogenous groups. And if there's no diversity, it's difficult to pick that out in a natural way. And you're almost like presenting something that seems like not related to them at all. But if you have a mixed group and it already exists, oh, how wonderful to be able to say, oh, you see this person? See how I got uh -huh. that purchase because it was really diverse. SUNY. It, <laughs> it, Go SUNY. Education because all kinds of different people coming together, learning about different experiences of life, right? Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you're going to be an actor, don't you want to know more about the world around you and how other people experience life? And mm -hmm. so that was part of the gift. I was given that in my years of learning, I learned that, yeah, diversity is key to a good learning environment and you should mm -hmm. all 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, in this case, more is more for yeah. sure. And yeah. I think SUNY is accessible to so many people that it was its own kind of melting pot. I don't know if it still is. I went from SUNY to Temple and I graduated from Temple, but Temple was also a really big melting pot where I was exposed to that's, a lot of people. That's marvelous. Anyway, yeah. then I went to New York. I started teaching in New York. But I was also, of course, working on my own acting career. That was the dream, was to be an actor. I did work quite a bit. Hold on. Can I pause you for a second? That time in your life, did you know what it was to be a dialect coach? Or had you still no idea? And you found that out later? Oh, I knew what it was because... Okay. The woman who had been one of the teachers I had at Purchase was a woman named Liz Himmelstein, who mm. basically you know, one of my really important mentors. Okay. Yeah. Because I know a lot of people are, you know, you move along. For me, it was a linguistics background and I came along and I realized, oh my gosh, this is a thing? Accent coaching? This is, of course it's a thing, but I had never thought about it. And I feel like a lot of people- After, right? Because Uh I do actor training, which is linguistic related, but it's, you learn the phonetic alphabet. Then you learn about operative words. Then you learn Mm -hmm. about rhythm in language. Then you learn about, and this is all stuff that's in linguistics, but it's it's more like, how do I apply this to building a character? Yeah. Which is, the way I approach the work still. My work is to support an actor's creation of a character. So maybe we can use that as a great way to start talking about maybe some of your past work, or if not, maybe we can talk specifically about the holdovers and what you remember about how to create a single person and and their speech and their idiolect. Because I was asking you before about you having come from Florida, maybe to Michigan, to New York, now to Rhode Island, and the idea that sometimes we can relate a little bit to somebody else in our own experience. Tell me if I'm wrong here, but it might have been a challenge for you to personally relate to the character of Mary in The Holdovers because she was a Black woman in the late 1960s, early 70s from Boston and working in a service field too. So I'm curious, to create a working class accent, a single person who is identifiable in that way, what's your process? How do you add that to there? Can we talk a little bit about specifically the character of Mary? Absolutely. And and just so you know and your listeners know, the actor that played Mary, her name is pronounced Davine. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, but people we'll always say that. I think I did it first, too. And she <laughs> said it, it's Davine. And it's a D-A apostrophe B-I-N-E. So... FYI. Yes, I do that thing. A lot of us do that thing where you read something so often, it's just stuck in your head. I think it's called calliope syndrome. And yeah, it happens to me all the time. I think she's pretty accustomed to people saying divine. It's not a bad name to have, divine, whatever. But anyway. Yeah, there was a famous actress, I believe, in the 70s named Divine. I think that's why I'm also associating it with that, too. So thank you for correcting me that. But what is it about working with, let's say, divine, who in your prep in your coaching. How did you kind of mold that to a very specific sound? We can talk about the phonetics and things like that too, but I'd like to talk about the phonetics of some of the vowels, the roticity, obviously. And also, like you mentioned earlier about the pacing and things like that, maybe some of more of the prosody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And rhythm stuff is prosody, right? Let me start with Davine first. I met Davine working on a film called The United States versus Billie Holiday, which was a piece about Billie Holiday, a very specific case that the FBI was after Billie Holiday for singing Strange Fruit, that the United States government did not want Billie Holiday to sing, and they were chasing after her and trying to get all kinds of things on her. But anyway, Davine played a supporting character in that film and really loved the work that I had done with Andrea Day. Andrew Day played Billie Holiday and was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actress that year and also Mm -hmm. won the Golden Globe for Best Actress that year. Mm -hmm. I think it was 21. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's how we met each other. And then Davine reached out to me to help her prepare for Ruskin, the piece about Bayard Ruskin, who was a very important civil rights leader who was gay. Rustin, wasn't it? Rustin, R-U-S-T-I-N? Did I say Uh Ruskin? Rustin. Uh Okay. By Rustin. Gotcha. Uh, but anyway, yeah. so she was playing Mahalia Jackson and wanted some help with Davine is a classically trained singer. So we put our heads together on finding the bridge between Davine's voice and Mahalia Jackson's voice and Ooh. commonalities, but also what's the bridge? You maintain yourself and we never want to do an impersonation because you end up leaving yourself out. Have to be there too if you're gonna yeah. be a character and then you <laughs> 
Can I pause you there for a second? Because what you said is so important since we're talking about like social justice issues and voice and accent. Number one, a lot of people think accent is just vowels and consonants, right? But it's so much more. We were talking about posture earlier and we're talking about prosody and idiolex. And here's the thing about like a voice, a person's voice. It's just such an extension of themselves. And when you are playing a human that lived and breathed at one point, I think that's so important what you said is to leave some room for yourself for the actress, because I think that is so important, what you mentioned here. And maybe the listeners, they don't actually think about that because they're thinking, oh, it has to be a recreation, a copy and paste. Otherwise, I don't like it. I don't believe it. But no, yeah. I think there's so I much I a more lot of these sort of creating a person who actually existed. I'm helping an actor. I didn't do the performance. I helped. I helped Jennifer Hudson with the Aretha Franklin that she created. I helped Nicole Kidman create Lucille Ball and Lucy Ricardo and... Mm -hmm. That they needed to be two characters because Lucy Ricardo was a creation of Lucille Balls. And so mm -hmm. we studied both voices, both characters. And obviously, there were similarities between Lucy Ricardo and Lucille Ball, but they were not the same because mm -hmm. she made some alterations to her own voice in order to fulfill that character. So then Dave Vine came around. We got to know each other working on that and working on the Billie Holiday film. And Dave Vine came around with this and said, I need to learn a Boston accent. Can you help me with that? And then it'll just be prep work, right? So you'll just be helping me get it ready. And then I'll probably want to check in with you throughout the shooting from time to time. And we did like once mm -hmm. or twice mm -hmm. a week. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes Dave Vine would send me a voicemail saying, can you just say the word church for me? And I'd be like, yeah, church. <laughs> Repeat so, it like 10 yeah. times. Yeah. <laughs> Give me an ear worm. Send it back. Is this right? Okay. So anyway, and that was great fun back and forth with the voicemail sometimes. But we did. We went through the whole script with a fine tooth comb and really worked on everything. But the first thing for me to do was to find her a good person to listen to. Because obviously, I'm not a black person from Boston. I'm also not where I'm currently living in thousand and what is this, 24 now? And At the time of recording, yeah. <laughs> we needed 1969 into 1970. Mm-hmm. So then I go searching. I'm, the internet's incredible. I tell students all the time, we used to have to go to the library. You didn't do your research. You have no excuse. So anyway, I was like, okay, famous black people from Boston. Went searching through lists of people, trying to think about who would be right, who would be right. And then there it was, Donna Summer. Donna Summer oh. from Boston. Uh -huh. so I was like, I knew that I could find a lot of interviews with Donna Summer. Donna Summer was also a singer. So probably uses her voice well, mm. like Dave Vine uses her voice well. So there'll be a, like a nice vocal match, similar mm. voice in a way, but not necessarily. Dave Vine's more classical and more mezzo-y soprano. Donna Summer's probably in the mezzo range as well, but a whole different style of singing. But anyway, that's just mm -hmm. about flexibility of technique. But back to Donna Summer. So I started listening to some interviews and I was like, yeah, it's Boston. It's Boston. Yeah, it's Boston. And it's lovely <laughs> Boston, which is even better because Boston's a dicey accent and people from Boston are very picky about it. And I was like, we need to do it. We need to do it in a subtle way. And we need uh -huh. to be really consistent about what we do, yeah. all the things we need to follow through on. So that's what we did. What I do at first is when I finally find the sample and I try to find the speaker in an emotional moment, maybe a little. Do you mean that you try to find the speaker? You mean the model speaker and the recording? Well, the person we're going to study, right? Oh, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. the, the idiolect, right? Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Individual. I do try to zone in on an individual because mm. there's such a variety within a region. Right? Yeah, absolutely. It could be confusing. And if you just really get to know one voice, it can be really helpful. And not even just place, but also time. Move five years forward in the future, move five years back, or change social classes just a little bit within the same time in the same place. And I feel like it's, oh, a, it's a whole different thing. Oh, a whole different thing. And yeah, technology has changed the way we speak. There's so much that's happened since then. And also the amount of being able to hear each other that we can now because yeah. of it has also changed. You know, regionalisms aren't as strong as they used to be. It's definitely changing. So anyway, what I do with the sample, and in this case, we had chosen Donna Summer. I try to find a section of them speaking in an interview or something else it, where they're 
in a passionate place so that I can hear the voice when they're not in any kind of formality. They're not mm -hmm. in a place where they're trying to sound correct or mm -hmm. speak a certain way or whatever. They're just letting what they do fly. My experience is that's when somebody's angry, tired, or drunk. I was just saying <laughs> that. So, so I try to find an emotional moment so that I can really hear what comes forward. And you'll notice that. You mentioned code switching earlier. People, all kinds of people, we all code switch. Yeah. Our degrees in our lives. Trying to find a moment where nobody's in a code switching mode, but just mm. in, this is really the way I speak. This is the way I speak with my family. You know. What I mean? Yeah, what you're saying right now reminds me of in the movie when uh, I think it's Christmas, they're at the Christmas party. She's playing the records and she's a bit drunk as well. So I think that that's a really good representation of any of us where we're not necessarily switching, but we also have different modes of our voice and to our cadence sometimes yeah. and how we... Yes. So what I do first is that, again, I find that section and then I go to my computer and I start a document and I just type exactly what I hear them doing. Any dash, where the breathing is, all of it, because that's the base for me of every dialect that I work on is number one is the rhythm of the word. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because yeah. that's the pace or the movement of that individual's way of thinking. And thinking is a body experience, right? Mm -hmm. It has all of your body's responses involved. We're already getting to like the pulse of the way of speaking. And again, even while I'm typing, and now I have to go back and listen again and type some more and go back and listen again and type some more and go back and listen again and type some more because people speak quickly in order to get every little nuance in what mm -hmm. they're doing. And that process of going back and forth and listening again and again is drilling the rhythm into me. And I start to hear it like music. So rhythms first, and then I start to pay attention. There are three things that I talk about for dialect. Rhythm and pitch use, the musicality of the way of speaking. Vocal posture or placement. So that's like, where does it live in the mouth? Mm -hmm. Is it in front of the mouth? Is it in the back of the mouth? Is the tongue released or is the tongue tight? Does the soft palate lift or is the soft palate collapsed? Do they place, is it in the bridge of the nose? Is it in the teeth? Is it in the middle of the mouth? Mm -hmm. Is it on the cheekbones? Blah, blah, blah. Then there's also the gestural life is really important. That's mm -hmm. the physicality of the way of speaking. How does this group of people that speak this way, how do they use their hands? And You're... move their heads. And uh, like you were saying earlier, it's the rhythm of the speaking. Oh. It's not just your thinking, as you said. It's also like just how you live your life and how you move your body. And when you sit down, how slouchy are you? And like your whole cavity and all those things together. And you're putting those things first. And I think when most people think of accent, they, they the really top. think of pronunciation first, right? They think of the phonetics. I think yeah. of them last. That's a result, I think, of all the other things combined all of exactly. the, it, it just shapes everything and then it comes out in that way you know what right. i mean that's right that's mm -hmm. right so i come to those last but i do come to those and we definitely talk about all of those so you said okay so what are some of the phonetics for a boston accent for example there's the i think it's a raising or a rising a raising a rising when it comes to more of an e eh sound or even an uh sound. And as far as I know, when there's an a before a nasal, I think a lot of us do that to some extent, depending on where we grew up, but very strong in Boston, but not just before a nasal. When you have a as in cat before a lot of the fricatives and the stops as well, at least in Boston, it's even more often raised. And when I say raised for the listeners, raising the jaw from a or the posture to a as in bed or head. Yeah, so I think that's one thing that sometimes sticks that out. That ends up making it sound like, instead of like the word can, sounds like can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So all of the diphthongs of R, almost all of them, you do not pronounce the R. You do if the following word starts with a vowel. Let's see. Phyllis, bears, surely, raw, fa, right? So the diphthongs of R. Mm -hmm. Vowels of R, like stir, that actually keeps an R like it also does in New York. But it adds more of a consonant R than what we typically do, which is like er, more like church. I mentioned the word church earlier. So that would be in that lexical set. Church becomes church. You can hear the Irish in that pronunciation. So the church, farst, right? Mm -hmm. Artist was determined to be the farst at the university. So mm -hmm. the Irish have two changes for that particular sound, depending upon the spelling. Boston is almost the same as one of the Irish ones. And mm -hmm. New York is the same thing. They don't say, are you going with huh? 
They say, are you going with her? Huh? Arr, 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 arr. There's a uh, constant R there at the end, but it's very... Mm. That's because of the massive amount of immigration in Boston from and specifically the Irish immigration since both, the 1700s. In both places. Mm. In New York, it's an Irish thing as well. That Irish thing actually also happens in New Orleans because there was a big Irish community that landed in New Orleans too. Mm. And so there are certain parts of New Orleans where they'll say something like, Boinicha. Almost sounds like a Southern accent and a Brooklyn, New York accent. <laughs> I should say dialect and not accent, but we use those terms interchangeably in my mm -hmm. view. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting too that what you do is called dialect coaching. You might be doing some dialect work, but really you're doing more accent work within some dialects. And it's funny how you mentioned the Boston, the New York, Louisiana was not on my list, but also the British accents, because I was going to ask you just to maybe contrast a little bit, if you don't mind, like when people hear these things, but how would... You the phonetics of Boston. Don't you want to hear more about the phonetics? I do. I totally do. Look in this, though. I do want to come back yeah. to this. Yes, tell us more about the Boston phonetics. I think we were talking about R's, but we hadn't really talked about what's sometimes known as like R dropping or R insertion or anything like that. I think we were talking about like vocalic R versus consonantal R's. So yeah, yeah. keep telling us about those vowels. So the R dropping is just that it's a non rhotic way of speaking, right? For the people that are listening that don't know, I have a rhotic accent. I have a somewhat general American accent, mm -hmm. which kind of a, a term is a little dicey. We also have that we could talk about later. Yeah, but I speak American, basically. Mm -hmm white American. And I have a lot of R colorization, which mm -hmm. American speech is one of the brogues. Americans, Irish people, and Scottish people, brogue, which mm -hmm. means when we pronounce an R that is in a vowel situation, like a diphthong or the vowel of R that I mentioned earlier, which is the one that's in stir, the schwa at the end of the word, like in mother, when we pronounce any of those, if we are brokers or rhotic speakers of English, then we pronounce that R with vigor. The Irish do it really lightly and clearly. The mm -hmm. Scottish actually tap it and sometimes even roll it. And Americans just grab the base of the towel <laughs> it way down. Yeah, and like a lion. Yeah, I asked a friend of mine from the UK once who speaks non-rhotic English. I asked, so what do Americans sound like to you when we're speaking English? It just sounds like you're choking on everything you're saying. <laughs> I guess that's accurate in a way. But anyway, so that's the difference between rhotic and non-rhotic is that treatment of those vowels and diphthongs of R. Mm -hmm. The inserting the R, I've always called it intrusive R. Oh, so, yes. Yeah. Intrusive R. Yeah. Maybe I'm thinking of the yaw insertion versus the R intrusion. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's. Yeah. So the intrusive R, people from Boston will say, Lisa and I are going to the store. Lisa <laughs> and I are. So that's a mistake that all non rhotic speakers make. And I love it because the rhotic speakers don't make that mistake. And I think a lot of the times rhotic speakers feel like they're the lesser speakers of English. I think as we bow down, Americans have typically bowed down to the non-rhotic upper class British sound. We think it's, oh, that's so posh and fancy. But anyway, the way the Queen spoke, but the Queen had this intruding R too. All of those non-rhotic speakers do. I'm constantly trying to get my Australian clients to not do that. And, and mm -hmm. sometimes we're successful, sometimes not. But anyway, so that's what that is. Also the back vowels. So law, all mm -hmm. daughters thought they bought straw. Mm -hmm. Boston becomes higher placed and a little rounded, but rounded higher in the cavity. So it's not like New York where you would do all talkative daughters thought they bought straw. It's more like all talkative daughters thought they bought straw. So you can hear I'm rounding it, but I'm rounding it in a higher place mm -hmm. than my hard palate into my nasal cavity. And then the, the other vowel that's like that is let's stop at the shop at the top of Dodge. Shorter vowel. It's not as round, but people in Boston round that one a lot. So they would go, let's stop at the shop at the top of Dodge. They've got a lot of odd clocks. Mm -hmm. on. So those two are really important to look at, those two vowels. Like the goldfish cracker. Uh -huh. uh <laughs> I haven't thought of that. And I'll tell you something. Honestly, I generally stay away from that whole merger and a lot of those things when I'm teaching people whose second language is English or third or fourth or additional languages English. I bet you don't teach those two. You just oh, God, no. do them the same. Oh, God, no. Unless somebody starts asking about it, then we open that can of worms. But I don't usually introduce it because, yeah, if you're trying to already get your head around a few other it's things, that, that's a tough one. 
just do what most people in the United States do. Majority of the population does those two vowels almost the same. But mm -hmm. when I'm teaching anything from anywhere else, we have to learn it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And my clients will start noticing that and they'll say, oh, wait, I thought it was this sound, but I'm hearing this one. I'm like, oh, that's fantastic that you can hear that. Now let's talk about it. And yeah, I really like those kinds of things. I really like what you were saying about the diphthongs too. The schwa at the end of the word, like mm -hmm. mother, has a release that pops up. Rhythmically speaking, they do this kind of upward movement. My Can mother, you give an example? Uh, yeah, my mother, my father, my sister, my brother. Mm -hmm. As opposed to New York would be more like my mother, my father, oh. dropping down and back. Yeah, like yeah. Kind of going forward. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. The rhythm thing was like, the first time I taught Boston, which was many years ago, I was thinking about it. I was like, Gosh, it has that rhythm of a little dog that thinks it's big. It's like <laughs> So, you know, it's it's this mini 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 mini. Don't add a ton of variety in the use of language. In the syllables. No, in the syllables, no. Not not uh -huh. a lot. So that's it's more staccato. It's much more staccato. So that's to your prosody question, right? It's yeah. Like with the rhythm. Is it so they'll get louder for emphasis? They don't do stretch or length or variety. And <laughs> Which I'm curious. I don't know if you happen to know this. I wonder if Gaelic or Irish or because you know how language systems work. There's languages that have that syllable stress timing. And then there's English that has the word stress timing, right? Time stress. And I'm curious. I wonder if Gaelic and Irish have have that more syllable stress timing. I don't know. Maybe that's something that's a legacy from that. Do you happen to know? I think it's possible. If I think about, I don't know that from like a scholarly standpoint, mm -hmm. but I've taught Irish accents for years. And so I do know the thing about an Irish accent that's very important is that you keep it moving. It mm -hmm. has to be going and moving, but they're not necessarily staccato. Irish people tend to be very lyrical. Yeah, maybe that's the wrong word for it. I'm trying to think of length. I think I'm trying to think of a way to describe the syllable length that you were talking about to me. It's very clip. But then you, you could be dealing with other parts of England there. And you're also dealing with people came over here a long time ago. And that part of the country is primarily influenced by British and Irish stuff. So it could be stuff more from England and mm. something. Yeah. And like you mentioned, we've been here for a while now. And so that drift starts to happen too, where it just becomes its own little thing too. And it no longer has anything to do with the old country. Absolutely. And it is the, the way that Americans speak English is is an older way of speaking English, just like the Quebecois is an older French. Oh, yeah. It, it's from another time. And then it mm -hmm. got isolated in that place and then found its own sort of trajectory. Mm -hmm. And then we've had so many influence here of, of people from different cultures immigrating. And then that added to it and the adoption of other languages and words that came into English from other languages. And it's just English is like the language that ate the world. Yes. And then we throw it back up again, too, in a way. Of a language. There's some great books about that. There's the story of English. There's the mother tongue, which is a really mm -hmm. cool book about that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love. I eat those up, for sure. Also, just when I was a child, like anything I can get my hands on with those things. Yeah. I just love to know more and more. And it's great now that we have so many resources, like you said. And you, maybe you'd, we have all these samples. I know when I was a, a child, I had TV and we didn't have cable when I was a kid. But now you can just get so much from everywhere. If you just look and it's in this little device that's in your pocket. So if you want to hear those things, it's like, we have no excuse anymore. I feel like to say to somebody, what are you saying? I don't understand you. I, I just feel like that's often a power play or out of some other feeling of, I don't know, inadequacy or something like that. When really, there's no reason we can't understand most of the people. Or just too. plain bigotry. Uh, uh -huh. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've decided no, I don't understand you, like, therefore yeah. I'm above you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? It's absurd. Mm -hmm. You have a strong accent and I'm not even going to try. It's ridiculous. Because I don't have an accent. Right. <laughs> I, I, it's me. Oh, I can't tell you how many people say to me, I don't have an accent. And I go, yeah, you do. Everybody has an accent. Exactly. You can't speak without an accent. It's usually somebody like who has a pretty pronounced accent that will say to me, I don't have an accent. You don't and neither do I and neither does anyone else. Let's just put it that way then. Yeah, totally. That's a curious thing. Like, why is it something to be so protective and odd about? It's a marvelous thing, right? We're ashamed of. Like, why? Yeah. I think a lot of people, at least they come to me originally, yeah. they come from a feeling of shame or maybe they've experienced prejudice. And so they feel like they have to fix themselves 
themselves, let's say, and that's what they come with. And then they realize, okay, number one, it's not about the vowels necessarily, but it's about voice. Like we said, it's about like you being who you are and knowing that and being proud of it. Yeah, if there's communication issues, of course, that's a problem for anybody. But yeah, like you said, I think it's, I mean, it's something you know, different. Teaching somebody to pronounce a T somewhere where they're not pronouncing a T, big deal. And if somebody pointed oh, that out to you, probably something else. Yeah. We don't know that. We experience these things and we think it's, oh, it's what this person said to me and I have to do something about that. But it turns out it's something else. Yeah. So speaking of which, maybe speaking of class so issues, hierarchies. As far as the phonetics go, there's a mm -hmm. lot that we haven't covered. There's confluence. There's the fact that she was a black woman in Boston. So that means it's highly likely that there are some Southern isms in the speech as well. And so having some of that at play with the Boston was essential and important. There were free black people in the North for a very long time, but there were also a lot of black people that came up from the South during the great kind of migration from the South that happened the turn of the last century. And then again, like in the 1920s, there were like two phases of it where people just were getting out of the South because you could not make a living there and you could not be treated as an equal if you were not white. Mm -hmm. they, they went to the North. And it's interesting, they went, different parts of the South went to different parts of the North. It's Cleveland area is very Alabama. Chicago is very Mississippi. The Northeast is very sort of North Carolina, South Carolina, as far as where a lot of black people migrated from the South. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense because you get somebody in your family with a foothold there and then, yeah, it makes it easier. Well, where am I going to live? Probably where I have ties. When I first started teaching again in the Northeast, when I first started teaching a lot of Northeasterners how to do a Southern American accent, and they had, it was bizarre to me because I grew up down there and they would struggle with such a thing was, I was like, really? Okay, all right, we're going to learn this. And a lot of them, their only real frame of reference I would say, okay, think about the way black people speak in the North. There are Southernisms in that sound, and they could find their way toward, the, um, these were white students, obviously, mm -hmm. that toward some more sort of Southern American sounds by way of having a frame of reference that made sense to them. Mm -hmm. But these days, I would have to do that less just because we're exposed to so much all the time now, again, through the mm -hmm. media. We're, we're much more connected to each other, oh, and in yeah. some ways, less connected to each other, oddly, because of that. Yeah, there's an opportunity that exists there that we're probably not grasping as much as we could, and and um, making use of as much as we could. Sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. Do you happen to remember two things? One is, as you were maybe looking at the script, do you remember anything that stuck out to you or an opportunity that you saw where, oh, yeah, we can add a little tear or here, oh, look, did you notice this is a Southernism here? Do you happen to remember any of those things? Just looking at the word printed on the page, or do you remember any opportunities where it ended up being a good use of those Southernisms? I can't think of any one specifically right now, but <laughs> I know there were many. And I think it had a lot to do with an understanding of you can allow yourself to maybe stretch the words a little bit more than a typical Boston accent, which is really clipped because of the Southern influences in the rhythm. And maybe that would happen at the vowel. It would be on the vowel. Of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, that's where you have opportunity for length. And the length allows you the opportunity to release what you feel into the sound more. So mm -hmm. that's really key for an actor. Mm -hmm. There's not much length, then it's going to sound somewhat wooden. And I think that can be why sometimes when people hear people from the Northeast speak, they think it seems rude or harsh. And it's because the rhythm is very fast and clear. Mm -hmm. And cold in a way, yeah. Because if it's shorter, you don't have much time to inject that little yeah. pitch change. And or if they're, if they're speech. Issues, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. more than one note to collect your point mm. of view, your opinion. Mm. And that's what feelings are. They're an expression of your opinion about what you're saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've, I've, intonation is one of my favorite subjects too. Pitch change and things like that. And how should I put it? It's let You can study it. Let me give you a quote. Please. This is an oral interpretation teacher named Wallace Beacon. Mm -hmm. He said, way that we use pitch, tone, or color in language has a purpose, and that purpose is to arouse feelings in the listener necessary to convey your meaning to the listener. That whole explanation, what he's saying is, it's mm -hmm. all about the person who's listening to you. 
So it's all about your relationship to the other person. Otherwise, why use words? There's no need for them if we're not going to be using them to relate. All of this stuff is really interesting and wonderfully nerdy, but it's really and truly about communicating. That's and what, connecting, what it's think. about. And it's yeah. about connecting. Yeah, it was the purpose of communicating to have community to connect. Yeah, well, otherwise, what purpose does communication in general serve? The words are there to back up and clarify the meaning. But if you were just to have a conversation with me with no discernible, let's say, consonants or vowels, and your intonation was there, I think we could totally understand each other, which is what you do when you encounter somebody who doesn't speak the same language as you. And it's not mutually intelligible. We can still rely on that. And we have thousands of years to to show for that, I feel like. Absolutely. I don't know who said it, but I've got a shorter quote about intonation. It's, intonation is what the dog hears. Yeah, <laughs> that's great too. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's another thing to go back to the rhythm and the pitch use or the musicality of the way of speaking. I often encourage people early in the process, listen to this like it's not English. Listen to this person speaking. You can't speak this language. Just listen. Mm -hmm. Variation in tone, the movement of the rhythm, and then I have them do it now do it in just a made-up gibberish. Repeat what you hear them say. And then we add the words to that and float them on that because that's the kind of the choreography of it all. Because the end part is you just shaping the air, basically. Yeah. And the rest of it is all of your meaning, all of your intention, all of your motivation, your yes. needs, your desires. It yeah. all comes from the intonation first. You know how when you had a TV on in the other room and you can, you yeah. can hear it and you know if you're watching a soap opera, you know that somebody's cheating on somebody else and they just yeah. Oh, yeah. out or their yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> dead twin brother just came back to life or whatever the story because you can hear the intonation so yeah it's the same thing this is what i think for me really hit home about divine joy randolph's performance is the subtlety number one right there's a consistency like you said in the inconsistency because there are words there or there are things there that we thought we could predict and then you're like oh wait but maybe that is the southernism there so it's a very right. particular time and place and person and probably even job. If you were a cook at that time, there's probably some in-group language there that other people who were, let's say, construction workers, they just didn't speak the same as, let's say, cooks did at that time. So for me, it's just an amazing performance. And I think we mentioned this earlier about the pace and the slowing down. The very first thing that hit me when I saw the character at first was just like the calmness, but also it was calm, but powerful because you can be calm and reserved or you can be calm and, and commanding. And to me, that's what I picked up from that right away. Well, that's a little bit more of a voice thing going on. And that's also Davine. Book yeah. is very spiritual. And what you're speaking to there in relation to a spiritual element, the way the performance is connected to the breathing life, the way mm -hmm. the per breathing and Davine's entire performance, it's connected to her breath. It's mm -hmm. on the breath. There's a reason that we don't run out of breath when we're in conversation, because our thinking and our breathing are directly connected to each other. We have an idea, the body has its response to the idea, and then it sends information back to the brain that we then work through our reasoning brain to come up with language to express what the body's response is to what we wish to say. So it's the body and the brain are communicating with each other through the breathing. So thinking and feeling ultimately become the same thing, which mm -hmm. first, it depends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the expression. We're, then we're getting into the neuroscience of what happens when we come to language. Which is also super nerdy, and I love yeah. that too. To me, like we said, it's not just vowels and consonants. There's just so much more to language and connection. And you mentioned something earlier. I think when we mentioned connection, I forgot to blurt this out, but it, it's also sometimes we want to disconnect with people and we want to use our voice and our body and our breathing to show that I don't want to pursue this conversation anymore or like I'm not feeling comfortable in a way. And so I think it's important to remember too that if we can pick up on those signals as well, that's another side of communication that not all of us are good at picking up on those little signs and telltale things. Do you know what I mean? Sure. sure. You'll hear if somebody's holding their breath. You'll feel their energy pull away from you when somebody mm -hmm. holds their breath, mm -hmm. right? You'll feel uh, almost a deadness in the space. And then if I have a student who's doing that, I'm like, breathe. You're not <laughs> I can't, if you can't feel what the person is saying, if you're not having a body response to what they're saying, it's likely they're holding their breath. And sometimes it's not but, conscious. Well, it's not conscious. But if you're going to be a performer, you have to become conscious of that. So many things. Performer's job is to make the audience feel what they feel. And if you're holding your breath, there's not a chance that the audience is going to feel it because what sends the feeling into the space 
for somebody to participate in the feeling is the movement of the breath into the space. If you're holding your breath back in order to not reveal what you feel, nobody's going to feel what you're feeling. But you notice that. You'll see that. You'll see somebody's holding their feeling. If you're attuned to it. I know we can say that there's a lot of people who just don't care to notice those things. They don't practice it very often. And then some people who are just more intuitive. That's why I use the word can. You can recognize Yeah, absolutely. You You can recognize it in their body language. Where does the tension reside in their body? If they have a lot of shoulder tension, it's likely that they guard their heart. I didn't know that. That's very interesting. Yeah, somebody who's like this, guarding their heart, right? Oh, that makes sense. I think the more you know about these things, the more, like we said, the better you can connect with other people and they might be unconsciously doing things that they might not be aware of. But if you can read that in the situation, you can at least make adjustments to how you react. Or might even say, hey, what's going on? The better somebody knows you, I think the more they can pick up on those signals too. Yeah. Yeah. But we can all be better. At that. Yeah, you that's something that's really that. important to me. Absolutely. And then, and then through the medium of movies and series, I think it's a really good vector to approach these kinds of things because there's so much that's charged about, like we said earlier, it's the power, it's the prejudice. There's just a lot of stuff in there that if we use movies as like a neutral zone, then I think it's a safer way to get everybody talking about these things. And we're getting somewhere with it. We are making some progress with this. I'll put it to you this way. If the person has gotten their idea across to somebody else and that other person has understood their idea, what they wish to communicate has been understood, then the communication is successful. That is actually all we're going for here, to have a successful communication. Anything after that is some kind of a judgment somebody's placing. Yeah, we don't have to agree. Some of your clients that maybe they have a strong accent when they speak English, or they have a little accent when they speak English, or whatever, I'm sure you have a variety of clients. But in your working, you said, with many of them on clarity, mainly Mm -hmm. at that point, I just want them to be understood by people when they go out in life and speak to them. That's a successful thing right there. That's it. That's your goal. What you're serving is clear communication. Yeah. For the most part, yeah. And then also, I think empowerment too, to then understand, oh, this is my voice. This is who I am. I don't need to apologize for it. I know that what I said is clear because I know how to say it. So if you're asking me what three times in a row, that's something else going on there. And just recognizing that it's, maybe it's not you, maybe it's them. And I can move on. I can from this person. I don't need it. Exactly. Yeah. And deciding what's worth it and what's not. Maybe you're having trouble with your tongue doing the difference between an N and an NG sound. And that's because there's no NGs in your first language and you just didn't know that. And so you thought they were the same or things like that. THs, right? THs. How much time are you spending with THs? Because day one. It doesn't show up in a lot of other languages than English. It's just, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I feel like we're cut from the same cloth in a way. And I really enjoyed talking to you about this today. And hopefully at some point in the future, we can talk about some of your other works, maybe your process, something like that. I feel like there's more nuggets in there that you have to share with other people who are interested in listening. There's a lot more to talk about, but I hope I gave you a taste of something that people will find useful. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Obviously it was a wonderful performance and in some part that's due to your work and I know that you worked with her before and she probably sought you out specifically for that reason. So that's just a testament, I think, of what your skills are and your ability to communicate those skills to somebody else in a way that they can find it useful and then transmit that to all of us on here. She's become a a friend and I'm really happy and proud of her. And uh, I I love the way she's using her platform to uh, inspire others. I don't know if you've noticed all of the speeches that she's been giving, the various she's been winning, but all of her speeches have been very inspirational and affirming of Mm others, telling her fellow performers to stick with it and hang in there and keep going. And you never know when it's going to click and change for you. So to keep with it. And then the amount of gratitude she's expressing constantly is just, it's really, it's beautiful to see. Yeah, it's so great. Yeah. And I'm so excited to just also share that with other people too, who might not even think about it or know about it and just open their world. Folks, if you haven't seen it, it's such a beautiful film. It's just the whole, I I love all of the performances in the film, honestly, and I'm thrilled that I got to help with one of them, but it's just the film itself is so worth seeing if you haven't Mm -hmm. seen it. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Oh, I loved it too. So let's let's end it there for today at least, and we'll say hopefully see you soon. It was a pleasure talking with you. You too, Tom. I hope to talk with you again sometime. Okay. Awesome. See you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye. 
My favorite take from today's talk is how pronunciation is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to accents. So thanks for listening to this fantastic conversation between me and Tom Jones about Davine Joy Randolph's Boston accent in the movie The Holdovers. So if you found this episode helpful in any way, please subscribe and leave a review. It's actually really helpful to me. Now, before I go, I have two tasks for you to do. First, I want you to register and come to my free monthly masterclass. They're on the last Thursday of the month. In just one hour, you're gonna master a specific American accent skill. For example, the TH sound or rhythm. The Zoom registration link actually changes each month. So the second and maybe more important thing I wanna ask you to do is to sign up for my mailing list because you're gonna get the registration link each month. You're gonna get bonus materials before and after the masterclass that I only send to my email list subscribers. The email opt-in link is down in the show notes. Be sure to sign up for my mailing list and come to the monthly masterclass for free. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I want you to know that your voice is your choice. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now.